So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, plant soil sciences seminar. So, Rebecca asked me to remind you that next week is our 3MT competition, three to four, One, Friday. Noon to four. Noon to four. I'm noon sorry, three to four. Noon to four next Friday. Uh, so today, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Wayne Parrott. Uh, it's a pleasure for many reasons. Um, Wayne is a UK graduate. He earned a bachelor's, bachelor's science degree in agronomy from the University of Kentucky uh, many years ago. I try not to give years out. No, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, and he also uh, uh, earned his degree through the Honors Program or Honors College here at UK. Uh, after earning his uh, undergraduate degree at University of Kentucky, he uh, earned master's and PhD degrees in plant breeding and plant genetics from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He then returned to the University of Kentucky and did postdoctoral research in Glenn Collins' lab for uh, some time. Uh, Subsequently, he uh, took a position at the University of Georgia, worked through the ranks, uh, and has been for several years a professor in the Department of Crop, Crop and Soil Sciences at the University of Georgia. Um, we're really very fortunate to have Wayne giving this talk today. Uh, Wayne is an internationally renowned expert in areas of plant transformation, in the use and application of biotechnology for uh, 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 crop improvement in agriculture, and also for assessment uh, and regulation of genetically modified organisms in the, 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 the greater like legal sphere or whatever. Um, Wayne has uh, garnered over the years many uh, awards and honors. Uh, he served uh, the scientific community and uh, the, the larger society in many very important ways. I think uh, for me, the, the easiest way to convey this is uh, just to note that his contributions to the science and to the agricultural enterprise are reflected in his election as a fellow of the American Associate, Association for the Advancement of Science a few years ago. Uh, today, Wayne is going to tell us about debugging soybean. Uh, Wayne, welcome to Kentucky again. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, so it, it's really good to be back. Uh, being uh, back here has brought tremendous memories back. Um, I did start here as an undergraduate. I actually got to work uh, for a summer for Dr. Egley. So it's really good to see him here. I remember when Dr. Hunt was hired. I remember when Dr. Phillips was hired, so that gives the, uh, you the time frame of when things happen. Um, at Georgia, I have had several projects over the year, but if there's one project that's actually my pet project. It would be uh, this one. Started working on it about the time I got to Georgia. It's still going on, and we've gotten a lot of recent results that haven't been published yet, but the, I can uh, share with you. And uh, no entomologists in the room because I didn't put any true bugs in the talk. It's other types of insects. But. So the further south you go, the worse the uh, defoliation pro uh, problems can be in soybean. This is a field in South Georgia. And uh, if you notice towards the center, the farmer was spraying his soybean field and his sprayer started to sputter and eventually either it broke or ran out of insecticide or whatever and he didn't finish uh, spraying the field and uh, uh, two days later it's been completely and absolutely defoliated. So uh, soybean does have to be sprayed continuously throughout the summer. Um, in general, uh, the amount of damage, uh, yield loss, and control costs to the soybean crop in the U.S. is about $5 billion a year. It'd be a lot more if you throw in South America. And in spring, insecticides, from the farmer's perspective, uh, increases the cost of production. 
Uh, other sectors of society don't care for the residues left behind. If you're underneath that spray, uh, you're out of luck whether they meant to control you or not. So in general, having a resistant crop is considered the most uh, economical and the most sustainable uh, approach to, to insect control. So the story in soybean starts before my time uh, in Clemson University, where in 1969, they had an outbreak of Mexican bean beetle. And there were two entomologists there at the time, uh, Jim Bendine and uh, Sam Turnipsey. And what they did is they planted out the maturity group seven and eight uh, swinging collection and looked to see if they could find any resistance to defoliation by Mexican bean beetle. And what they found is that if they measured the larvae, the larval weight of the uh, I think 800 lines they looked at, they found three that suppressed larval growth. If they measured egg masses, the same three suppressed egg masses. And then they numbered, they counted beetles on the plant, these three uh, PIs or genotypes uh, led to, you know, also suppressed the beetles for the plant. So, uh, the, the PI in the middle there, the 451, is very similar to the 358. So we started working with the two different ones, 358 and 687. And all the work I'm going to talk to you about has been done just with those uh, two different uh, plant introductions, and they're both uh, Japanese origin. So the, um, these PIs are just not agronomic types. You know, they're semi-wild types. If you notice uh, the, the one, how it just rambles and you know they completely lodge the seed and it's got a lot of black uh, in it. So uh, over the years, uh, uh, breeders that tried to back cross this resistant into agronomic soybean, invariably they got the resistance and lost the agronomics or they, uh, got, uh, they lost the resistance and kept the agronomics. And it was this difficulty of getting resistance in an agronomic type that made um, transgenic approaches uh, so um, appealing. So since my mission at Georgia was to work on transgenics, one of the first plants we did, this is a postdoc, uh, Neil Stewart, we developed a BP soybean and uh, you know, it, it held up very well under the worst uh, insect uh, pressure. And uh, we even went as far as doing some field trials with it in, in uh, South Georgia. And as you can see from the graph, the, the BT lines were pretty much untouched by insects um, compared to the non-transgenic types. But the question then becomes on how informative are field infestation. We have no idea what insects are there, when they got there, um, or whatnot. So we, starting with David Walker, a graduate student, we um, moved over to uh, artificial infestations inside field cages. And you can see how one of these would be set up. In this way, you know, we would add the caterpillars to the plant so we can tell you what insect species we were using we could uh, obtain a very consistent infection across all plants and control the, the insect pressure by controlling the number of insects that we would put out. When we start doing this, a lot of the limitations to BPs become apparent. So here you have uh, the same uh, soybean line uh, with three different insect species. And what you'll see is that and, you know, the first one is developing caterpillar, it, it completely controlled by BT, core and earworm, not so much, and soybean looper, really not at all. So the first limitation is that a single BT protein was not going to be equally toxic to all the defoliating insects that had to be controlled in soybean. And secondly, uh, issues with sustainability, single genes, are easy to overcome when it uh, comes to resistance. So we started looking for 
things that we could, or transgenes that we could add to the BP and um, to supplement the strategy. So at the time, the strategy was known as a single high dose BP gene, meaning it was pressed, uh, sufficiently high to kill all the caterpillars. And then if you combine that with a refuge, an area where you don't plant BP, where susceptible insects can live and survive, it um, is a successful strategy. And in fact, uh, I think initial projections were that it might last seven, eight years. And in many areas of the world, it's lasted uh, you know, 20 years and counting, but sooner or later, it will fail. So, be, uh, so particularly in our case, with needing something that was more broad than just specific to one species, we uh, tried to pyramid with the only transgene that was available at the time, which was a trypsin inhibitor. And we found that the trypsin inhibitor actually does a better job of inhibiting the BT than the insect. So we abandoned that and the other BTs had not been cloned at the time. So, um, however, marker-assisted selection was coming online. And if we go back to the PI, uh, again, depending on the insect species, it could be almost as good as a BT. So we started mapping the sources of resistance in these two uh, PI. Um, before I continue, just to give some background information, we divide insect resistance into two, there's several types, but from a functional breeding perspective, there's two types. The first is called antisinosis, uh, fear of strangers, and it is uh, selecting for types that the soybeans, that the caterpillars dislike. It's not a choice experiment because you see the block of plants and the caterpillar can move anywhere it wants to on those plants and select the one that tastes the best. And, uh, you know, we can also put them in cages, put one complete wrap in each cage and let the caterpillars uh, wander about there. That kind of works a little bit better because they like a little bit of shade. So then we just measure uh, defoliation. So lower defoliation in a resistant versus high defoliation in a susceptible. Alternatively, there's antibiosis, where it's actually got a detrimental effect on the insect. So here we put one genotype in every cup and then a caterpillar. And the caterpillar has to eat what's in the, in the cup. It has no choice. So it's a no choice experiment. If it's susceptible, the caterpillars will grow very well. And if it's resistant, the growth of them is going to be inhibited. So the insect resistance genes that you find are going to differ depending on whether you test for antibiosis or you test for antisinosis. So Brian Rector was a student that started the mapping. He developed a mapping population between the first PI and a conventional variety, did his uh, antisinosis tests, and he found this one QTL that was a linkage group M, so we call it M, the major QTL, and it explained close to 40% of the resistance. And there was a second QTL that we called H because it was a linkage group H, and it just also explained a good amount of resistance. Now, if you took the same populations and ran them through an antibiosis assay, QTL M still appears, but H does not. Instead, there's a third QTL called G, accounting for about 20% of the resistance observed. So we started to make isolines, near isolines, back cross all the QTLs using markers to make near isolines. And once we had the, in the uh, QTLs isolated individually and in all possible combinations, we could start testing for QTL specific effects. So here's an example of the three QTLs that have been uh, moved into the variety of the benning. And you can see the benning is nice and green and you can see the other soybean is turned brown. 
This is Mexican bean beetle. And this one, uh, this resistance that we're working with is effective in coleopterans and in lepidopterans, which in itself is very strange in, in resistances. A lot of them tend to be more focused on one instant group or another. Um, no, look, we could find interactions. So for example, if you have no QTLM present, it really does not matter if H is present or not. It doesn't have, H has no effect. But if M is present, you have an M effect and adding H then increases the amount of uh, antisinosis that you get. And the same is true for antibiosis. If you have no M in the picture, uh, there is no effect from the QTL G. It's the same whether G is present or not. But in the presence of M, uh, adding G really increases the level of antibiosis that uh, you get. So now we can start explaining some of the phenomena the breeders have observed. We went back and looked at all the lines that were supposed to be insect resistant that breeders had released, uh, Jim Norvell, a postdoc in the lab. And it turns out that all of them got QTLM in their back process. Not a single one of them got H or G. So that explains why they could never recover the full level of resistance. Uh, as far as the second PI goes, uh, Brian also did the mapping. And when he did that, uh, he found a QTLE uh, and H that, um, but E was present uh, both with an antibiosis assay and an antisinosis assay. And again, many resistances are just one or the other, and this one is both. So, it turns out that QTLE co-maps with uh, a locus for sharp uh, trichomes. It's a PD locus. And uh, the uh, glycine soja, that's the ancestral soybean, pretty much uniformly has sharp trichomes. But if you look at the uh, cultivated types, they have the recessive PD, which gives a blunt type of um, pubescence. And uh, my personal hypothesis is that that comes from the time when soybean was primarily used as a hay crop. I worked in red clover long enough to remember how itchy the sharp trichomes can be. Um, so I think we, we did select for this blood trichome. So looking at this data, David Holbert, another student, looking at uh, near isolines for uh, that either that just differed by sharp or uh, blunt trichomes. Uh, if you do the antibiosis assay, um, at least for these two species, the sharp trichomes have a large antibiotic effect. And if you do it, uh, antisinosis, the sharp trichomes are downright uh, much more resistant than the um, uh, blunt trichomes are. So it was very tempting at the beginning to believe it was a uh, trichome issue. Uh, this is uh, Milton Lieberman. He was a, I used to teach tropical agriculture when uh, we had a, a campus in Costa Rica. He was a co-instructor and he knows the, the thorns on those leaves there. They were super effective at keeping students from wandering off the trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, so the initial reaction from everyone was, oh, it's got to be a sharp trichome that is killing the insect. But most of the soja are susceptible and still have tri sharp trichomes. And the Brazilians did some work and found that it's graft the resistance is graft transmittable. So it can't be the sharp trichome itself that is responsible for the, for the resistance. Regardless though, uh, this is the near isolines that we did with MG and H. At the same time, we were back crossing the sharp trichome into uh, Benning, which then allowed us to cross it too, 
and you get near isolines that had one or any combination of all four QPLs together. And we started evaluating some of them. This is Maria Ortega, another student. And she was working uh, to, to, uh, on some of these isolines. And yet again, looking at caterpillar weight, what this shows you is that no QPL, H or G by themselves, um, really have no effect. M and E are much bigger QPLs. There is an effect from having them together. And um, here you see the combinations and you can see that the multiple QPLs are at least statistically as effective as M and E by themselves. And from a breeding perspective, uh, working with M and E, two QPLs is much easier than working with a broad spectrum of them. Uh, looking at Anti-stenosis, she also did uh, field trials uh, with these. And when she did that, here's her data after 11 days in the cage. And uh, again, bending H or G by themselves really have no effect. Uh, e and M have, you know, have a discernible effect by themselves or the various combinations then have the highest level of uh, resistance that actually allows farmers to skip a whole spray. And uh, so again, M and E is the, the resistance. And she also did, uh, here's some of her data against a whole assortment of lepidopterans. Because again, uh, you notice that she tested against the soybean looper, corn earworm, fall armyworm, velvet bean caterpillar, and uh, this ME combination is effective against all of them. In which again, a lot of resistances are just you know against one species. So based on this, we decided that, that you know that's the type of resistance we want to deploy in a breeding program. The soybean breeder in Georgia then uh, started back crossing it into some elite lines, and um, then um, here's last year's uniform uh, yield trials. We don't have this year's uniform field trials yet, but if you notice last year across the Southeast, uh, Q, the QTL M and E combination was number one as far as uh, yield goes um, by quite a bit. So uh, we're quite excited that uh, it's been worth the investment in isolating the and deploying these QTLs. So, we also, besides developing cultivars, we also had talked about the durability issue. Remember at the beginning, I mentioned we needed something to combine the BT. And there's already reports uh, starting to come out from Brazil that, uh, you know, the resistance, they don't know how much longer it's going to last. So in this work, again, done by Maria, what she did was she got three species Velvet bean caterpillar in orange is the most susceptible of all the caterpillars to BT, but then soybean looper and southern army worm are not very resistant. So those are the what, how they grow on uh, non on just regular soybean, and the ME combination knocks them back uh, a lot. And by the way. These caterpillars, and they've been knocked back that far, will still pupate and they'll still give you adults, but they're sterile. At least they have been in our hands. Looking at BT, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's velvet bean caterpillar is super susceptible to BT. You can barely see black dots on the screen, whereas uh, it, it's not effective against southern army worm or soybean looper, but if you add the ME combination to BT, and you again get them to a level where you can control them. So we, we think you know this is an alternative way to manage resistance. So about then, um, so a talk like this, if someone said, okay, you're, you guys are doing a great job killing insects, is it safe to eat? And that kind of threw me for a loop because I had not given it any thought. But we teamed up with uh, Adam Davis, a nutritionist in our poultry science department. And what we did then 
was feeding trials with uh, poultry. Um, we, uh, you know, between the time an egg hatches and you, and it reaches five pounds, uh, which is broiling size, it takes uh, five to six weeks. And when an organism is growing so, uh, so fast, it's pretty sensitive to any uh, per, uh, metabolic uh, perturbations in its diet. So we had to grow our isolines at the same time, in the same place with the, um, with the um, same management, sent them to Texas where they have a microgen that processed them to make commercial meal, sent the meal back to Georgia. And uh, we did the, uh, the feeding trials. And uh, when you look at the data, uh, there were no differences in growth at any time uh, due to this. So we feel that there should be no problem uh, when you're, at least if you're a vertebrate, there should be no problem if you're out, you're out of luck. So what causes resistance? And you know, that, that's been a linger, uh, lingering question this whole time. Uh, this is another collaborator, Nick uh, Kovinich. Uh, he's just moved to York University in Canada, but he did a non-targeted mass uh, spectrometry of these lines and uh, he could not find any new peaks from coming from the new lines, but simply adding them up, uh, significantly upregulated about 200 peaks, simply adding E upregulated about 100 peaks, adding uh, the EM combination would upregulate about 700 peaks until you add insects to it. When you add insects to it, then uh, E gets another 50 or so peaks that go up, M gets a you know, number of, uh, you know, go up by a third and the EM combo then is at over a thousand upregulated peaks. So there's a lot of changes that are going on. And it figured that, oh, by the way, this paper just got accepted for publication on Tuesday. Um, so the only way we're gonna really get at sorting through all this is trying to figure, clone the genes and figure out how they work. And here's a legume leaf uh, from about the time the uh, dinosaurs got wiped out. And you can already see it's got the foliator damage on it. So we weren't, I guess, uh, ex we weren't explain uh, expecting any simple explanations as because uh, there's been so much time for the plants to develop uh, their defenses against the foliators. And uh, if you guys have any ideas or thoughts on how to go forth with this as I present the data we have, by all means, uh, please share. So we started, uh, these are two postdocs, uh, Doju and uh, Boken Ha. They did uh, recombinant substitution lines uh, with QTLM. And uh, then, you know, after phenotyping them, we're able, we're able to narrow the, seg the M containment uh, region to this one segment that was about 180 kilo basis in size. Um, we made a back library, you know, uh, context, the whole works, found and sequenced that segment. And then when you compare it to, uh, com compare it to the uh, reference genome, the reference genome is uh, susceptible. It has 11, or had 11 gene models in it. And if you look at the annotation for the 11 gene models, unknown function, unknown function, mid related, nothing here screams insect resistance at all. So annotation was not overly useful. If we look for SNPs between uh, the resistant and the susceptible, we can eliminate anything that has no SNPs. And I think we're down to seven gene models. So what we did at this point was make a panel of 37 ancestral soybeans to the US germplasm pool. There were 37 of those. And then uh, looked at for those SNPs in those seven gene models 
uh, among these lines. And if any SNP was shared with a susceptible type, uh, we eliminated it. And when we got done with that, we were down to just two gene models. Of these, then, um, looking at gene expression 72 hours after feeding, uh, notice that the, uh, the 530 gene model is upregulated uh, or it has higher, uh, it's upregulated when it's 72 hours after feeding, whereas the 470 model is not upregulated uh, compared to the control, the other gene models. But we also, uh, she also, uh, again, took the transcripts made cDNA and sequenced the cDNA. And what I'm showing you is the way they're annotated. They both have introns and exons. Upon pulling out the cDNA and sequencing in it, it turns out the uh, annotation was not that correct. And uh, one of them actually has an intron, the SNP and an intron. So that helped us start that one as our candidate gene, leaving us with the 530 as our top candidate. At that point, um, we, again, we pulled up all the, there's the ancestral soja and the max, any soybean genotype that had been called resistant in the literature, we pulled them out and you know, had been called resistant, not necessarily verified as such, but possibly resistant. And we looked at these two gene models in all those soybeans, and uh, there were four of them that had this one SNP, and they were reported to be resistant. So we're, we're starting to feel more confident now that we had the right gene. And uh, the way it's, you know, a putative uh, flavanol glucosyl transferase and what ha does that have to do with resistance? But this, the resistant version then has a premature stop codon, gets a non-functional uh, uh, truncated protein. So uh, both the susceptible and the resistant alleles are upregulated upon feeding. It doesn't matter if we use whole plants or if we use detached leaves, they, they're both upregulated. So we went on to make the transgenic complementation and silencing lines. So in the transgenic side, we put the susceptible allele into a resistant soybean. And then we put the resistant allele into a susceptible soybean. Whereas for uh, silencing, we tried to silence both the resistant and the susceptible alleles. Uh, got, it made three events of each one, uh, self them, uh, selected for homozygotes, quantified them at the T2, made our choice assays, went on to the T, uh, T3 and made our antibiosis assays. So I'm gonna walk you through the results. So beginning, uh, this would be, Jack is a variety, it has a wild type allele, meaning it's a function, you know, full length functional allele, but it is susceptible. So what we're doing is we're adding a resistant gene into a susceptible, keeping in mind resistant here is recessive. So we're really adding a recessive which means we don't expect any difference. And if you look at that, when we add the transgene on top of the wild type allele, there is no difference. Alternatively though, if we start with the resistant uh, soybean and we add a uh, susceptible allele to it, uh, keeping in mind that susceptibility is dominant, we expect increased susceptibility and that's exactly what we got. Next, when silencing lines, uh, take a resistant soybean and we're silencing a recessive. So we don't expect any changes. And in fact, uh, we, we don't get any changes in the silence lines. Alternatively, if we silence the dominant uh, we're silencing the susceptibility. We expect increased resistance, and that's exactly what we get. So at this point, we're pretty confident this is our gene. How the heck does it work? 
So um, if you take a close look at some leads, susceptible versus resistant. And if you notice, the susceptible has uh, you know, nice and green, but the resistant one has uh, this dark rusty looking spots that you can see. Um, and uh, there are um, you know, really uh, red dots there uh, that we think are uh, pro anthocyanidins And you can measure these and in fact in the resistant type, uh, these are way uh, regulated versus the susceptible type where there is no appreciable increase. So what does this enzyme do? And at this point, since that's not my strong point, teamed up with some folks from the com uh, Complex Carbohydrate Research Center, Pradeep and uh, Brianna. And uh, to begin with, we had a heck of a time just expressing the enzyme. We could not express it in E. coli, could not express it in yeast. Finally, they expressed it in human kidney cell lines, and then they can use a purified enzyme for in vitro assays. And here's some of the preliminary results. The way to read this is you have blue bars and brown bars. If you look at the bottom dot, uh, dashed line, any blue bar that exceeds it is a compound that's being uh, 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 no, galactosidated. And if you look at the dotted line the, at the top, any brown bar that exceeds that is, being, is having a glucose added to it. So it looks like it's a pretty promiscuous enzyme in terms of the substrates that it can uh, get. It, uh, it, it can be a galactosidase or a glucuronidase. Um, here's, again, work with uh, Evan, a graduate student, and other colleagues on campus. Uh, LCMS uh, on some of those compounds. Uh, in this particular case, you know, uh, the, the uh, gallocatechin and the epigallocatechin disappear every time we add the enzyme to them. Uh, where we're stuck is that we haven't found what appears there. But um, we do believe, though, it is working in, in that category of compounds. As far as QTLE goes, uh, Evan, so what you're looking at here is a SNP map of QTLE in blue back crossed into Benning in red. And this looks like there have been a whole series of double crossovers. And no, there's no double crossovers in there. In fact, it's a region of the genome that barely recombines. What it's telling us is there have been some sort of rearrangements. And uh, none of the, this region has not assembled very well in any of the uh, soybean assemblies that are out there. So it's a bit of a mystery. But uh, here's the two attempts that have been made to map QTLE. Uh, a group in Utah mapped the, the blue, mapped it in the blue region. Uh, our group mapped it in the green region. And then this past summer did uh, GWAS on, on the PB locus. And doing GWAS um, puts it right in the middle of that first mapping. And if you zoom in on where the GWAS is mapping, over here, it's the uh, gene model uh, 6500. And it is the closest ortholog or ortho -log that soybean has to the GL2 gene in Arabidopsis. So a little bit about the GL2 gene in Arabidopsis. Uh, it's involved in trichomes. When you knock it out, the uh, Arabidopsis trichomes go from branch to sharp, but it's uh, also a transcription factor, a negative repressor of anthocyanin biosynthesis. So in Arabidopsis, when you knock it out, you can see your anthocyanin levels uh, go up. So here's one gene that then can explain the metabolic pathway and the shape of the trichome. So that's our candidate gene. Um, here you see three isolines uh, of, uh, that have this uh, uh, PB locus back cross into them. It's got a variable length repeat in it. So there's a, a plethora of alleles out there. 
but every time uh, the, the ones for sharp are always tend to be smaller than the ones for blunt. And um, when you look at the expression of it, if you look in you know, both the blunt and sharp trichomes, here it is in, in the, the blunt type, anytime you have a blunt type, it is upregulated upon insect feeding, but when you have the sharp type, it seems to be permanently upregulated to some extent. It, it, there's not, it doesn't really change when you add insects to it. So that's as far as we've gotten on uh, this gene yet. But um, it is enough to start having a, a, a hypothesis that we're going to try and test. But based on uh, where it acts in Arabidopsis as a negative transcription factor um, around uh, F3H. So since this was uh, constitutively regulated, we, you know, it's, we think it's a, uh, it, the flow of metabolites is constant. Whereas G, I'm sorry, uh, QTLM, uh, Seems uh, it's a remember it's a non-functional gene. It prevents the uh, glucose oscillation of various compounds, so these cannot be stored away in vacuoles. So we have the front end front loading, and the back end cannot uh, sequester the compounds. So we think they're accumulating in the middle and getting shunted to various uh, different. Um, other compounds. And that probably explains why the resistance is just as broad as it is rather than specific to a single insect. So I'll be uh, stopping there. I've got to thank my colleagues that helped do all this work, the soybean breeder and the entomologist, uh, uh, you know, particularly without the John's entomological insights, since that was not my background, uh, made a huge difference. Both of them are retired now, but uh, we have a new breeder who is equally interested in the project. He's the one that's uh, put them into the breeding lines and will be releasing the resistant variety. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Glenn Collins, a great mentor, uh, really prepared me for tasks like this. And of course, funding agencies, this has been the toughest of all my projects to fund. But we have had some funding for it. And that's really it. You know, it's our goal to have a resistance swimming, and we're finally closing in on it. So thank you. We have time for questions. How do we take questions from the audience over Zoom? Um, it should be fun, but you might, if you have your microphone, you might just. Uh... Or the one you had, Art, and give it to the people who ask questions, or we can ask Wayne to repeat the question before he answers it, whichever you want to do. So, how about people who are attending this by Zoom? How do they? Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. Let me get up there. Um, we should be able to see it on the chat, I think. Okay. You can ask questions with the audience here. No, I think you won't be able to ask, ask if anybody on Zoom has questions too. And they would just chime in by chat. They could, or they could speak if they wanted to. Okay, it looks well, like we have nothing in the chat. We'll try this. Answer. So, questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yes. have a question. Um, so, you mentioned that um, these arms race will continue, right, between plants and insects eventually. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, in that context, where do you get your bioassays? Uh, what is the lineage of the insects that you use, and if they're representative of the diversity outside, and if they'll make any impact in the QTL, um, if you change your, your bugs that you're using for testing? So believe it or not, uh, there are companies that sell insect eggs, yeah. and their uh, years I have spent more on eggs than on PCR reagents. <laughs> uh, but they don't really release the lineage. I would suspect that it does, it, that things would change if you had a different lineage. What I can say though is that whatever they're sending us from the hatchery and what we have in the field 
almost certainly have different lineages and yet the resistance uh, seems to be holding up. And the fact that, you know, if we are, we've, you know, been resistant to the bean beetles in 69 and whatever the, however the populations have changed and we're resistant to the gamut of caterpillars. I think it's, you know, pretty robust. In the, in the, yeah, they have the strip lines that come diverse. Thank you. So you mentioned uh, lepidopterans and coleopterans. Um, what about aphids? Like, are aphids affected by these? No, things? they're not. Okay. And stink bugs are not either. Okay. Japanese beetle? Uh, we haven't tested it because we don't have Japanese beetle in Georgia, at least not where we are. And do they, are they like, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about soybean trichomes. Do they release substances as well? Um, I don't know that people know. Okay. Uh, we have some uh, lines where we've knocked out the trichomes with CRISPR and they don't produce isoflavonoids. So I think clearly there's synthesis going on there, but whether it's released or translocated, it just, we, nobody knows. Tim? Is there any way of increasing the density of the trichomes or? Yes, there is. Uh, yes, and there are uh, varieties. You can change the density of the trichomes and you can change the angle of the trichomes. If you make them too dense, they start retaining moisture and they start getting mold. So you can't, uh, uh, so you get near, there's a limit, a practical limit to how dense you want them. So nothing on chat that I see, 20,000 participants, but no questions. Okay, well, if we have no other questions and there's no one from Zoom, uh, I guess we should uh, thank Wayne for a great, very informative talk.